All right, copies of which are on sale at the front of the store. And without further ado. <laughs> I want to start by thanking Margarita, the shy introducer, um, and this this incredible bookstore. It's definitely, as most of us know, one of the very best bookstores, not just in the city, but in the country, probably in the world. Um, there's many I haven't been to. Um, but it's incredible that they provide, can you imagine what it costs them to be here, and they provide the free space for events like this to happen. They're really, it's such a great store. Um, and we're here uh, today to celebrate the publication. I run, my name is Johnny Temple, I run Akashic Books, based in Brooklyn. Um, and so we are the book publisher of this incredible book, Hard Art, full of these ab absolutely electrifying photographs taken by Lucian Perkins. Um, and as any of you have seen, if you open the book, um, the, the, the photos are um, absolutely alive. Um, and that's, I think, the most distinctive, thing, the most immediate thing one notices. As the publisher, we internally make our editorial decisions collectively. Um, and there is a member of the staff, I'll name him Steve Harrison, who hates all subcultures pretty much <laughs> unilaterally. He thinks that they're sort of pretentious. Um, and he just, they just give him the willies. And it was amazing how um, quickly um, he immediately saw that this book had to be published. And that was, that was um, very refreshing in the process and totally encouraging. Um, so we are proud to be the, uh, you know, play a, lend a hand to help make sure that these photos not just stay alive, because they will always be alive, those photos will always be alive, but they will be alive in public. Um, so I want to start by um, introducing Lucian Perkins, who is a um, hugely impressive a photographer with an incredible body of work, the winner of a couple of Pulitzer Prizes. Um, for many years, uh, I think 25 years, you worked at the Washington Post. 27. 27 years. <laughs> but who's counting? I remember that. Um, and now he is a uh, independent photographer and filmmaker. Um, also up here with me is Al McKay, who uh, who's at uh, the shows that are captured in the photographs, the four punk shows in 1979 in Washington, D.C., um, that are captured in the book. And he, he uh, wrote the narrative that runs throughout, throughout the book. Uh, Henry Rollins also wrote an essay, but Alec wrote the narrative. Um, and Alec is a musician uh, who's played in a bunch of really great bands based in Washington, D.C., The Untou Untouchables, Faith, Ignition, and The Warmers. Um, and he is also a writer. Uh, also with us tonight are Lely Constantinople and Jamie McClellan, please raise your hands, <laughs> uh, who, are, um, who I'm going to have a, ask a question to a little bit later on, but they played integral roles in, um, in creating part art. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask a few questions of everybody, and then we're going to leave enough time that members of the audience can get to ask some questions. So I wanted to start. Um, Lucien, with you, can you tell us how you ended up at these four shows 34 years ago? <laughs> if my math is right, you would have been about six years old with a camera in your hand. Um, what were you doing at these shows, and did you have multiple cameras or just a single camera? Um, actually, you know, it's funny. I was actually 26. <laughs> and, um, That's not work. No, then I'm only 35, so I think it's got something to do with the, the time, you know, what's it called? Time space work. Time space work, yeah. Um, and it's work for me, for whatever reason. Uh, but it's really interesting, Alec, Alec was 14 at the time, and and actually many, uh, I was at least on scene that I photographed in, most of the kids were 14 to 18 years old, so I was... Kind of like a grandfather in a weird way. I don't know if you guys remember back then if you were 18 and somebody was 22, it's a huge difference. Today, at least for me, I can't even remember. <laughs> um, but so there, there was a there was an age difference. Um, but also, I think more importantly, I was a summer intern, uh, 1979, um, and it was really interesting. I, I was about three weeks ago trying to remember. 
Well, it was 1979, Mike, and I was on the exercise machine at the gym because at my age, you got to do that. Um, and magically, the show comes on, and this guy has a book out on why 1979 is the most important wow. oh, year to usher in the 21st century. Um, and he doesn't bring up the punk scene in Washington. But he does bring up a lot of really interesting things. And, it, it, and I remember when I first came to Washington that we had the gas lines. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a huge oil crisis. The economy around the world was in, in bad shape. The Shah of Iran had uh, been had overthrown. Um, we had the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. Um, we had a hostage, Iranian hostage crisis. And so it's a really interesting year. Um, and I mentioned this last night, the number one song was uh, My Sharona by the Knack. So uh, there's a lot of room for improvement uh, <laughs> of music in 1979. Um, but there were, you know, D.C. at that time was um, a very quiet city. Downtown was deserted, usually on the weekends. And there's this one amazing place called D.C. Space, and it was a art, uh, um, funky art restaurant bar that played a lot of uh, music that no one else would, and art. Uh, and I, I frequented there, and I can't remember the first time I went there, but I think it was pretty close at the time that I was, it was, uh, I was still a summer intern, and uh, they had, upstairs they had a, room, a, a loft space that was just basically empty. And the Bad Brains were performing up there. And I really wasn't familiar with what punk rock was. Uh, but I knew this was an amazing band. And, uh, um, and there were a lot of kids. You weren't there. Uh, but there, I don't think that they, they were mm -hmm. <laughs> But you would have remembered it. Oh, right. yes. uh, but it was, it, was, it was my window in opening into this sort of underground scene going on in Washington, D.C. And, and I met with H.R. Uh, afterwards, and uh, he said next week they were going to do a Rock Against Racism concert in a place called Valley Green, which is a very rough area uh, in Washington, D.C. And I said, wow, this sounds amazing. So I, that was the beginnings of, of me documenting the punk rock scene. Um, in your long body of photographic work, um, but for the sake of this conversation, from 1979, um, these photographs through all the, the uh, work you did for the Washington Post. I'm curious to know if, and this is, sorry to put you on the spot with this, but what is, it, what is the through line that would connect to say, if there is there a through, a through line, that, and if there is, what, what is it that might connect the photos in this book to which are these sort of hyper-localized photos to your work internationally and in war-torn regions? Well, I, you know, it's funny. I, I should start out by saying, and my wife and I were talking about this earlier, I mean, one of the things that I've always liked photographing are sort of smaller cultures within a bigger society. Uh, not only the punk rock scene, but I, you know, this, a couple summers later, I photographed tourists in Washington. And, and to me, that was like this, this alien culture that would storm in through Washington every summer. Um, <laughs> as a matter of fact, the, the title of the, the magazine piece was, uh, um, what was it called? They it's came called, from outside the Beltway. They came from beyond the Beltway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, um, and I photographed the, the New York fashion shows, and I covered it as, as it was a little mm -hmm culture within itself, well, and I think all of these are. Um, but I think going on internationally, anywhere, I'm really interested in uh, culture, societies, and what they're doing, uh, whether it's a small village in Russia or the punk rock scene. I mean, all these things are really important in the sense of why people gravitate to, to living the way they do and why it's so important to them. And, and I think one of the things we'll find out later on is that this scene that I photographed was really important to Alec Mackay. And it's not only important to Alec Mackay, but it's important to generations of kids. And so it did mean something. And, uh, and I think that's something that's, for me, exciting as a photographer. 
Uh, for you, in, in the photographs, um, how much do the photographs help you to remember what was going on? Like, for you yourself, how vivid are your memories of the, of the, the shows that you were at? Um, and I'm curious to know, in your writing, if memory plays, like, a, you know, what role memory might, might play, if any, in your own writing? <clears throat> yeah, that's very interesting, actually. I think about it a lot. Um, part of what happened, I mean, one, an interesting thing that happened in doing this was talking to people that I found and I, mean, well, I already knew about. I remembered so much. In fact, that's what why this um, really came to be a project in the first place was that when Laylee came across these um, negatives, she was, um, well, to, you know, I won't go into the entire story, we can figure that out in a minute, but basically she was organizing his uh, collection and came across the, um, the negatives and said, you should look at these, I think you'll know some of these people. And I said, I think I'll know every single one of those people. <laughs> because I really, that is, I think uh, any of us have that time in your life or a moment um, when you are, um, you're at a threshold of some kind and you are so uh, real that everything that happens to you in that little time sticks. It's like you're impressed, you know, like it's you're um, forged, and that's what was happening to me. I didn't know that at the time. I was too young to um, appreciate it for in that way. Um, but that's exactly. I remembered so much, so many random details, so much um, of it. Um, but then there was other folks that, who I talked to later. Uh, particularly the like, guitar player for, for Trenchmouth, and I showed him the pictures and I said, you know, can you give me your memory about playing at Valley Green? These pictures are unbelievable. And he said, oh, I, I wasn't there. I didn't, I didn't play that show. And I said, look right here. And he said, well, that is my guitar. And I said, and you're holding your guitar and you're playing this show. And look at this show. Look at these pictures, man. I mean, how can you not write these? He's like, I well, I'm, it's coming back, you know, but it was still, and that show really, um, that, that, you know, because then the band that I, uh, that my friend Bert and I started right after that, um, we played uh, at Valley Green later, and it's still, it was kind of hazy, you know, like there was elements of it like, that were hard for me to, um, to like, recreate, and I think that's great, because um, that's actually more important than having, uh, like, really exact information nailed down. Um, so I think that it's great to play with those two things. I think the f uh, photographs are amazing. I like when they still have mystery in them. And that's one thing that's, I mean, I thought it was really interesting, Lucian, when you were like providing all the context for the time and these things. I like to um, avoid that. I like to, um, one of the things I think is really incredible about the photographs is, is stand alone. Forget about where they, when, where, who, and just look at them, and uh, they can really, to me, they look amazing just uh, as objects. And uh, sometimes it complicates things to, um, so even, and I tried to do that with the writing, was to not be, I wasn't trying to tell it like it was exactly, only the way I remember, the way I, not even the way I remember, the way I felt. And so it's, you know, just slide it back and forth, I guess. But um, that's the way I feel about memory versus, you know, photography, I guess. I will prey upon your memory a little bit further <laughs> to say, um, in, the, in the photos in the book, um, there are there are women in the book in the photos. Um, uh, there's you know beautiful shots that have many women in them. Um, but I, I looked, I scoured the book, and I couldn't find a single female um, musician. And, but I thought maybe the Slinky Boys. If I, was, I didn't remember if they had had a female member. Some not in that time. Not in that time. Okay. Um, but I, but I was I was curious if you, in, in your memory of it that you remember it as being male, you know, super male heavy and did the local scene presumably well. It did evolve. But I'm curious to hear what, what your memory is in that regard. Sure. Um, it's you know in these pictures there there are a handful of pictures at four different events, so it's not a great spectrum of um, of stuff going on. The Right off the bat, I can tell you that uh, in the Untouchables, the band that I just mentioned, um, so one of our greatest champions was this, a band called True Facts and the Insaniacs, and this was a woman who was the singer, who was also the, you know, the mastermind of the, the band, and we had a show lined up. Uh, they asked us to open for them at a bar in Georgetown, and I remember going to 
you know, sound check and going into this place and the manager saying, like, who are you guys? And I said, oh, you know, we're, we're the band, we're the Untouchables, we're playing. And he's like, how old are you? And I said, 14. He's like, get out! <laughs> and I said, oh, wait, we know And then I went and talked to, uh, I don't remember exactly how it went down, but true fact, I said, well, hey, if they're not playing, we're not playing. And the guy said, get the fuck out! <laughs> you know, like, so everybody, um, you know, we're un united in that. So that was a, you know, they were a, a leading band in the scene at that time. They did not, over time, then, you know, other things happened and they're not somebody that everybody talks about. Um, but that, that's, uh, she was like a, a, and she also helped organize these meetings when Madam's Organ was closing down. And she helped create this, um, I mean, like, we need to have a new space that's going to be like Madam's Organ. Let's meet, uh, how are we going to raise money for it? For it? That, she was behind all that. So there, there was, um, People who were not just musicians, but who were um, uh, leading figures in the scene, who were not men. <laughs> and then, of course, like my first uh, show that I went to was Patti Smith. Uh, the person that first dyed my hair was uh, this woman, a, a friend of mine's babysitter from down the block, who said that you know your parents are going to be so freaked out and they're going to hate me forever. But sure. Uh, uh, I would hitchhike to shows with Carrie Corrado, who lived, or Carrie Winter, who lived down the alley from me. Um, it was, uh, in all these pictures you see, you know, there's Ruth Gudekunst, who was a great, I mean, just, you know, uh, star in her own right, whether she had a band or not. Um, so there was a lot of um, women involved. I mean, it started to, as a man, I don't really, you know, it's hard for me to speak about, like, what's the role of women, um, but they were, they were, Plenty of, of women involved uh, at that time, and I think even later. And yeah, so that's what your question. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Um, I, I want to make sure that we leave enough time to have questions from the audience. But first, um, Laylee, I was hoping that you could come up here and talk a little bit about your incredible discovery <laughs> that led to this book and these projects. This is Laylee Constant. Hi. Um, well, Lucian had hired me. I, I actually left um, a, a really good gig to work for next to nothing in Lucian's basement um, <laughs> because I loved photography so much. And I also really loved his work in particular. Um, so I just sat in his basement for a year and was going over thousands of pictures um, frame by frame. Um, and that is when you really get to the heart and the meat of something, um, when you take that kind of time and care. And um, I don't, Alec and I had just started, we, we just had been together not that long, and I came across, I'd been looking at a lot of Russian work and a lot of work from Kosovo and other areas of Lucian's career, and then came across the negatives that were really, um, I don't even recall that they were sleeved, they were just in a pile of stuff. I mean, it really is, every photographer who may be in this room knows what that is. And every, every anyone who's now alive knows what that is because everybody has their phones and all their, their stuff. And so there's just this ocean of imagery around me and I just started looking literally at the negatives. I don't even think they were contact sheets at the time. Just negatives. They were so, asleep. But anyway, so I just started looking literally in his window. He had like this little tiny window, I'll never forget, in the back corner. And I just looked at every single one and I was like, I saw the valley green stuff and I had no idea what I was looking at. Because I, by the way, was not a punk rock kid. I did not grow up in that scene. I'm from DC. I'm a multi generation Washingtonian. But I'm not a punk rock person. Or wasn't at the time and so I mean I loved the music but I was not you know I'm that much younger and so I wasn't recognizing anybody until I saw that picture of Alec and all the stripes and I knew just from his it's just a like a thing that you see in someone that you know really well that you just you see the outline of their body and you're like I know that person and I know he's great. oh my god he's gonna just shit and so and he did and, he, and I so I called him and I said here's I think you need to see this mountain of stuff. There's there's hundreds of pictures of you, and now I see your brother, and now I see I think I see a lot of people 
that you know I don't know, but it, you probably do. And then I asked Lucian, I really will say something about Lucian. I went to Lucian, he was super busy at the time, obviously going all around the world, doing incredible, incredible work. And I asked him, can I take your negatives? Which is, I mean, he hardly knew me. He trusted me to do that. I took them to my dark room and I made every possible contact sheet I could make. And then I started making little tiny work prints just to see what they looked like. And that's what I started to give to Alec and his brother. And that's really where this all began. And the trust that Lucian had in me to say, look, can I hang on to these? Can I make something of these someday? Um, it's kind of, you know, that's where it, I guess, started. All right, great. Well, um, we can now start taking some questions from the audience. I had a question for Laylee. Um, <laughs> in looking at the photos and the editing process, was it first about aesthetic and then story, or was it story and then aesthetic, or both, or like how did you go about that? Um, story, aesthetic. To me, the pictures are. I wrote in the beginning part um, of the of my essay that. His frames, Lucian has this tightness to his frames and he gets super, super close. So to me it was the aesthetic, not really what I was actually looking at um, in terms of, you know, these, the bands again, didn't resonate with me. You know, I wasn't a bad brain, I wasn't a diehard bad brains fan. So I was looking at them as, as a photographer with, you know, a sensibility towards that first. Like the, the, the stunning, electricity of the pictures are to me what what make them um, Lucian, they just have his imprint all over them in that way um, and then the content and then the valley green to me are are just far and away I don't care what I'm looking at it looks like they're on the moon I don't even know where they are it's bizarre it's a very strange context I mean these little tiny kids who are looking at just rawness, you know, and that power that's in HR. It's really intense, and so to me that was an easy section to edit. Although, I will say, I'm someone who loves to look again. I can look at a, like a strip over and over again, and, um, and, and and have a tough time saying this is the best one of that, you know, 70 pictures. I feel like I kind of want to see those 50 out of the 70, mm -hmm. you know, and I think other people may or may not agree with me, but I, I love looking again at something frame by frame. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, how I maybe started the edit. Um, and then Jamie, I mean, just the phenomenal, <coughs> phenomenal pushing that rock up the hill with the, with the picture editing. Because after a while, you, you can't be redundant. You have to show, you have to be razor sharp with your, sort of like, that's just repeating mm -hmm. an image. Next question. Brave person. Well, here's something. Just you know, these pictures are all part of rock history now, and you said you were doing traveling for world history. So, did you look at these pictures in a different way of composing them or anything? But to have that mindset that this could be <coughs> rock history as opposed to world history. I, I, I didn't say them as history. Here, to be honest with you, and probably a lot of things that I do photograph, though now I'm, I, I'm a little more careful about how I think about history because I'm older now and I understand history a little bit better. But you know, back then it was like just documentation. I'm just documenting and having a good time, and, and the fact that these might be interesting five years from now didn't enter, didn't, didn't enter at all. And it's it's unfortunate. We talked a little bit about about it last night, but. Um, I worked for the Post for 27 years, and um, the photographs that I took from 1979 to 1988, all those negatives that the Post had in their possession were accidentally thrown out. Um, and as I talked about earlier, it was not only those, that, not only mine, but all the photographers, but there's also all the stuff from Watergate and Vietnam. Oh, wow. And, um, and what, what this book is, what this book is, what this book is, what this book has taught me is, you know, 
how important it is to save all your negatives. Um, I only reason I save these separately from most of my other post work is because I shot these on my own time. I didn't shoot them on the post time. Right. Um, and so I had all the, the, the negatives. And usually what I would do every year uh, for the post is I would go through and make a selection of my favorite images, uh, for, usually to, for contests. And I would always keep those personally just because I didn't trust the post anyway. <laughs> but the problem is, is uh, four or five images from my, the punk rock scene is not enough to do a book. And so I have a lot of, there's a lot of history that I have of other things that I photograph that I just don't have. Um, you know, the material to, to do with, and it's, and it's a real tragedy. And, and so now I'm really, and you know, when it comes to history too, is that we look at the images we took very differently 30 years ago, you know, 30 years from now. You know, and a really good example of this, I was very lucky to have Gary Winogrand as a teacher uh, when I was at University of Texas at Austin. When he died, he had, I think, 25,000 rolls of undeveloped film. Um, and, but, but he had a reason for it. He didn't want to look at those images until, as he said, I just saw it for what it was, which was a photograph. Hmm. And, and what happens is usually is, you know, every year you, I was taught, saying earlier, you know, you have to get, look for images for a contest. And, and it's very subjective because even within a year, you remember laying on the ground for five hours waiting for, you know, a car or somebody to run by to take a photograph. And you don't see it for what it is, which is just an image. You remember everything else around it. So it's really interesting. It's important to have that space so that you forget all that, and all the personal aspects of it. Because everybody else is just going to see it for what it is. They're, they don't know all the background stories. But also, as history moves forward, other things become important that may not have been important when you took the photograph. Uh, so, um, I, you know, I've learned a lot. You know, as I'm fortunate to still be alive and and, uh, and uh, remember back and and, uh, and have some things like like this project that I have complete. Uh, so, um, and I'm really fortunate that Lately and Jamie. Alec, you know, saw the importance of this and helped them, helped us all bring this together. Do you remember what you were thinking when you did those photos? <laughs> well, I just remembered, this is a pretty wild scene, and I, I should give you a quick story. Of course, I was I was a summer intern, and I was, I was always looking for stories, of my own story ideas, so I just, I saw this as another opportunity to do something that I knew no one else at the Washington Post was doing. And I remember a couple months later uh, going in, uh, at the time Bob Woodward was a Metro editor uh, at the Washington Post. And I remember going in and showing him these photographs and he just looked at them in disbelief. And he kind of, you know, he's kind of flipping through them and he very dismissively shaking his head and goes, this kind of exists in Washington, does it? And then he just looks at me and just walks out. And, uh, luckily, our Sunday magazine published it about six months later. Um, but for that time, it was a very different scene in terms of what was going on in Washington, D.C. Um, uh, um, but I, I was attracted to it, and, and I think for a number of reasons. One was just the passion and energy that, that these kids had. Um, and maybe subconsciously was the fact that we talked about it earlier was that all this stuff happened so close together, um, uh, and the the access that I had to to photograph not only the the, uh, the musicians but the, the people dancing so close together, um, it was just all this energy that was uh, amazing to capture as a photographer. Um, so I think I was I think that was my main draw. But I certainly didn't see it as something that would become historically significant. Um, any further questions? Jane. I have a question. How do you know? Um, so, uh, so we were just talking about this, Lucian and Sarah and I. Um, 
And Lucian, you said that it was clear that Bad Brains were just out in front of everybody else. Like they were better musicians, like HR had this insane energy. Um, and this is kind of for Lucian and Alec, like why does this book matter now? You know, why is this important now? Why is, why is looking at these four shows from this small, tiny slice of history, what's the significance now? Oh, you know, so, and Johnny too, like, you know the history, you're part of the scene, but, and we, we talk about this a lot, so it's kind of like, I have an answer, you know, but, but would you share, you know, your thoughts about that? Well, I, I don't have an answer, but I know Alec does, because he told, and I will let him explain, but he said that these, these shows were the most important shows Made me who I was today. I, I may be paraphrasing it, but you can say it like that. But, but anyway, no. This this is a question I think for these two. Um, yeah, that's that's accurate. I mean, I I was transfigured, you know, um, uh, seeing this music. I mean, it was a double transformation for me because of my age. I was fourteen. I was just doing what we do when we're that age. I was also getting it. I mean, I didn't even really have a I didn't get into something music-wise to have to get out of. Punk rock was my first, you know? Uh, and it was also fairly new, so that, and then having this, um, it was just by chance that the Bad Brains existed in that time um, in D.C. and hadn't left to come here yet. Um, and that was probably, that was really one of their very first shows. I mean, these, this is really early on in their career. Um, it started probably in 78, but then they really didn't play that much. Um, anyway, so that's, for me personally, that's how those pictures matter in a great way. Um, obviously, the Bad Brains are now, you know, they've become, and also a lot of the people that started up in that scene at that time have gone on to notable things that I don't know, a lot of people are familiar with. So you could talk about it that way. Um, but I also just think, I mean, I look at, photography a lot um, and I think and it's easy for me to look at these pictures without any kind of uh, backstory and be amazed by them. If I didn't know anything and I walked into this store and I picked up that book, I would keep going and going and going. They're just interesting pictures and it's entire, you know, it's your, um, his uh, um, way of seeing it at the time, not as a part of the scene, uh, but curious about it, so he's standing, if you'll see the vantage point, he's standing with the band instead of with the audience, and he's taking a picture of where the band and the audience are coming together, um, all that kind of stuff. And that's something that we, can, that anybody can have an interest in. Um, um, but I think it's also, uh, yeah, I mean, historically, of course, I mean, so much came out of this, and this is the moment before anybody in that scene um, had any feeling about any self-consciousness, any understanding of what we were doing or why we might be doing it. We just wanted to and were compelled to do it. And nobody, you know, I couldn't even figure out why somebody was taking a picture of it. I mean, it didn't make sense to me. I mean, why, was, who cares, who's gonna look at that? Um, thank God, you know, there were some to look at. Now there's, you know, it's, it's a bit different and nowadays I guess there's so much image capturing that um, that people are not even looking at the real, you know, they're viewing it through a machine uh, entirely. I don't, I mean, it, I'm, it's, we'll see what it all means in the future. Um, it, you know, whether the future really is, I mean, that's, you know, that time continuum thing you're talking about is, it's going to be complicated with, with the amount of, of images that we get nowadays. Um, I don't know if that answered the question exactly, but something like that. <laughs> Any last questions? I have to answer. What's the name? Put it in context. Yeah. Because the, the scene in, in, in DC was very important. And it became very important. I mean, yeah, I mean, for me, because I got involved in the DC punk scene, but started like, I think the first show was in 1983. Um, so that was a, a, few years, a, a few years later. But I mean, when I see, when I see the photos, and I, I, I mean, I think it's the power of the photos, and it's, it's weird to be talking about the photos. Presuming some of the people 
here and haven't seen the photos, when you open the book, you'll understand why <laughs> with the inflections of the discussion because they're so immediately arresting. Um, but for me, they, they, uh, it so powerfully reminds me of home um, for me personally. And, um, but I, I think it, it, they have a, you know, a huge resonance way past, of course, anyone who grew up in DC. But to me, it, it really reminds me of, of a time in DC that was just so, sort of so unusual where you would have a punk show in a housing project is like a peculiar American cultural moment, but it's so specific to Washington, D.C. and to, as, as I was saying last night, it also rem reminds me and makes me think about um, D.C. political history and Marion Barry and the role that Mayor Marion Barry, who is um, discredited for getting caught smoking crack, um, but, but long before that he was a civil rights hero uh, mayor for many years before all that happened. And one of the good things that he did was instituted this summer youth employment program. It must have been one of the very first in the country where every kid in the city was guaranteed a job. And, um, and one of the ways they kept kids busy for the summers was these music programs um, that some people were involved with and um, that were often run out of these neighborhood planning councils, with, which perhaps you can say a word or two about, um, but uh, although it's perhaps not really relevant. But, um, but um, it, inadvertently, Mar Marion Barry helped to sort of foster this environment that led to what you see in the photos, um, because nowhere else that I've ever heard would you, would you see uh, uh, punk shows at housing projects. And on that note, yeah, so as an outsider, were you aware of that when it was happening? I mean, that's the weird thing, right? You're, you're, you're like a bunch of little white kids in the middle of a housing project in one of the roughest neighborhoods in the city, and that's just weird. <laughs> I, was, I was very aware of it, and that, that was one of the reasons why I went. I mean, to me, it was like, this is going to be very interesting. Um, and uh, that, that's exactly why I went. And, and to me, it, it, it's fascinating because I've talked to Ali, and, and he can talk more about it if he wants to, but it had a huge impact on him going to this housing project, which I think it did for a lot of the punk kids who had never been to a place like this before. And it had certainly had an impact on, on a lot of the, the kids in the housing project, some of whom I'm convinced they were very little, had never seen a white person. And they're seeing quite a, you know, a version, you know, with uh, a lot of the punk rock the kids that were there. Um, so it was an, an amazing contrast. And, uh, um, and it was interesting, too, and, and you should tell, or you know, I guess you know the story about <laughs> how they, they plug the, the uh, amplifiers into somebody's... Um... Yeah, well, that's, that's the, how it happened, is that, that HR uh, was working as a... Um, he was like either guarding a parking lot or, or actually parking... I think he was guarding a parking lot at Southeast Hospital. And uh, he and the guy that he knew through there said, you can use my apartment to plug in your equipment. And, um, and so just... And it was... But his... The idea behind it was that there had been these rock dance racism shows in London uh, the year before that had they were like big production with thirty thousand people and the Clash and the Police and X-ray Specs and all these bands played um, and that was in response to um, Eric Clapton uh, saying racist things uh, which was really weird to me I didn't know that so I did a little research like really when did that but anyway so um, he said we should not. <laughs> yeah, it's a big old yeah. xenophobe for a while. Um, but they, uh, so we did these rock and treat I mean, it was HR's idea, but the, the way that he did it, the Bad Brains did it, and, the, and I guess the way we were all doing it was just don't even wait. If you have to stop and try and figure out how to make it happen, it's too late. You know, just do it. Do it, do it, do it. Um, so he got this guy to be on board with it, and we, um, I mean, the show that Untouchables and Teen Idols did with, in the same spot was. Later, the one that's in the uh, book is Trench Mouth and Bad Brains. I wasn't at that show, um, but yes, going when I when Bert and I uh, when we went over with you know with our band, um, it was intense. You know, this is a city that I grew up in. Uh, like Laylee's also, and she's multi generation Washingtonian. I also, my mother was born there, my grandfather was born there. You know, we're, we're been there, for, and I think of it as my city, like all of it. And this was a place I really hadn't been before. Um, I did grow up in, you know, in a church that was in a um, you know, riot-torn neighborhood and was not, wasn't protected from anything, but 
I hadn't been to Anacostia, which is you know, far across town. Uh, getting there, indeed, you know, kids are coming up and asking permission to touch my hair. Um, it was a big thing for both of us. You know, like, uh, and it's maybe cliche to talk about it. It's was strange to me to think about later that um, you know, in a modern American city, that uh, two races might have this sort of uh, uh, still this you know a gap between them. Um, and so in a way, to me, this Rock Against Racism uh, humble version of it was even more perfect, more better, you know, uh, than, the, than the huge you know, rock and roll shows. Um, I'm trying to remember the first part, of the, I really wanted to respond to it, but what, we, what did we start off with? Who's? How it influenced you. Oh, I know what it was, but I really want to talk about, though, was that uh, for this book, I tried to actually interview those kids. I um, found uh, some people that who grew up in that, I mean, that housing project is gone. They tore it to the ground, and it's rebuilt with these things called the Wheeler Road Estates now, and it, they're, um, it was a really, it was one of these, it was kind of like Cabrini Green, you know, something where the design of the buildings was initially meant to be, uh, provide this, community toss kind of thing where the buildings face each other and there's a common place in the middle and really when when it goes bad then it turns into like a fortress right and it's like the way that, that any kind of uh, place like that um, it's so the guys inside could see the cops coming the cops didn't want to get caught in the middle of all that it was a very intense uh, rough place so they you know when the time came they destroyed that place and moved people away um, and it was, I could not, in time for this book, find people to, to interview who might, I would love to get their stories, is my point. There's like a hundred, uh, in this store probably even, a hundred old punk, old white punk rockers talking about um, what punk rock meant to them. Um, and so it's, that's happening in great numbers, but trying to find this story from these kids who might not even give a shit, you know? That's the, I, I think that's gonna be the case. It's gonna, I'm, you know, gonna pursue this um, and I'm going to finally meet a handful of people, and they're going to be like, I barely remember, and I just didn't care. You know, like, and, but that's my, that's the stuff that I always chase after, is the things that, you know, when I get there, and people are like, I don't, yeah, I kind of that, who cares? Um, that's, that's the most obscure, obscure things. I don't know, uh, but any, but I will continue, actually, to try, and I, as I said, I, was, I met a woman who could name a lot of the kids uh, in the pictures, she couldn't direct me to them in time for uh, the book. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that this summer, though. I'm gonna continue with that. And agreed, you know, I think that, that those pictures are really amazing, really powerful. Um, they mean a lot to me personally, but I think that they just are great uh, photographs to look at and, uh, and I think compelling for the book. And it's also the ones that were not picked for the Washington Post Magazine article in 1979. They picked the ones of like the most, you know, obvious new wave people who um, were also shocking, but that was too out there. It was too uh, different, too complicated, and it didn't follow. Uh, we couldn't t talk about punk rock as in an easy conversation when there was this event that didn't have anything to do with anything else, and, um, which makes it even more special, I think. Um, that's the Valley Green story. During the work on the book, did you all look at the parallel? Well, I mean, it's it's parallel, um, but GoGo is is a bigger. It's head and shoulders above punk rock at DC in a lot of ways. Um, it's just much more of a. It's a. Um, he's asking about a band. This uh, sorry, music called GoGo, which is like a sort of DC, yeah, specific uh, music that um, uh, and bands get on stage and play this percussion heavy, really rhythmic music, and don't stop for three, four, five, six hours, and everybody's involved, and it's, um, punk rockers love Go-Go, Go-Go fans don't like punk rock as much. Uh, so there were these uh, fusion shows, Minor Threat played with Trouble Funk, uh, Government Issue played with, I mean, there's a lot of these things, and they, and they were amazing. Um, I also grew up in going to public school, and a lot of Go-Go band either were in this, you know, were people who went to the same school as I did. I think we even had a teacher, it wasn't Dr. Webb, and uh, yeah, he was one of the teachers was in a, a go-go band. Um, 
they would play in the, um, for, they actually stopped it after a while, uh, uh, I guess some violent things that happened, uh, so they, they stopped having go-go's in the, in the school. Um, but there was always this, it's a, it's a subculture, it's also a thing that the police didn't like, um, parents were nervous about it, there's a lot of uh, corollaries, I guess, um, so they make sense to, to talk about them together. Um, but they're not exactly related uh, in a weird way. I mean, you know, go-go bands, would, um, they work a lot harder. They have way better equipment. They're unbelievable musicians. They, um, they also can do it, like, I mean, I would, you know, as a punk rocker, I would just try to, it was, it was an unbelievable amount of energy when they're just playing like a 20 minute set. Like I couldn't play for a month after that. I had to be, uh, whatever, recuperate physically. You know, land in the hospital sometimes. I'm not kidding. I literally be hospitalized after a show. Uh, go go bands will play seven nights a week, uh, and they'll have twelve guys in the band, and it's just you know completely. They're so much more pro shop, and it's so much easier for them. So there's a lot of things that aren't the same. But, um, so. Yes, there's this connection, but there's also this you know, divide. But uh, DC also is a really different city in that way. I mean, it's, it's a, you know, what they call the chocolate city. And there's, um, and just something we all grew up with was, was having go-go music uh, just everywhere we went, it was ever present. Um, so it's, I think, um, embedded in, in the city much more than, I mean, you know, punk rock was sort of threading through, go-go was all over. I mean, it was, so it's the same and different, I suppose. One little thing, were you assigned this project? That's what I don't understand. You said you found it. But uh, or, no, no, how no, did no. You find I was, um, yeah, I just found Like a post, like a flyer or something like that? No, I was, I was just at this, this bar called DC Space and hanging okay, out and okay. heard this music upstairs. Uh, okay. and, and I was not assigned to it, partly because I knew at the beginning if I told the post about it. <laughs> So I just cut, shot it on my own until I had enough photographs, as I kind of said earlier, first approach Woodward, who gave it the axe, and later met another uh, uh, editor a few months later that did like it, so. Wait, can I also point out that Claudia DePaul is here, who was a DC Space, and Dan Joseph, um, DC Space booker and manager, and a uh, pretty important <laughs> person. He, he always talks about DC Space and being, this is why and how this book came. Uh, it was through that portal. Uh, it's really great to see you guys Good. It's, it's, glad, it's good to be talking about it. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's, what he's describing is, is a really important place in DC. It's, it's funny how, um, I don't know, there's just so many, uh, and I, I guess every uh, event or every uh, scene or something, has these uh, little t tiny uh, prisms that make all the difference in the world. You can't know at the time, uh, but that was one of them. And then also just the way that people were treating each other at the time. Uh, uh, I think you're right. Different. Everything went through DC space. And it, it was, uh, um, I wish we had something like it today. It's, it's one of those places that I'll I'll never forget. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was amazing. All right. Well done wraps things up. Um, I want to thank both you guys, Lucian and Alec, as well as Leila and Jamie. I also want to once again thank the store, and I want to say, like, again, like, wh whether it's a copy of Hard Art that you hope you will buy, but, or any other book, there's lots and lots of books, and the store, you've got to sort of pay to play in the stores. <laughs> so, so think about leaving the store, the store with a book in the book. Thank you all so much for coming. One more round of applause. For you.